In a recent interview, this trans pastor said that the Bible wasn't written for 2024 and that it's outdated. So let's have a look at this claim, let's have a look at some scripture and see what we think of it. So this is Drew Stever, a pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And before we get into the video, I just want to say that if you're looking for a video where I'm like, this person's awful, let's dox them, I'll tell you where they live and let's all go egg this person's church and their house, let, like, that's not this video, okay? Um, obviously I'm coming from a place where I really disagree with, uh, with Steve here about God and gender and the Bible, but this person is made in the image of God. They're deserving of um, care and love and dignity and respect, which is ironically a doctrine that we take from Genesis chapter 1, which Steve here is saying that's not really for now. Um, I think that's quite ironic. But if you're looking for a video where I'm like, we hate this person, this person's evil and awful, and yeah, it's not this video. But let's look at some of the stuff that they say because I think they're just so really, really wrong. See, to say that the Bible is outdated, that it wasn't written for 2024, um, to reference the passage where it says, God created male and female, and to say that that is a problem, that that fundamentally changes the way that you read the Bible and anything you can possibly take from the Bible. But let's hear, before I like have my own thoughts, um, let's hear what Stever says in their own words. A transgender pastor in America has called the Bible outdated. It wasn't written for 2024, it was written for then. Drew Stever is an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church and aims to make the church a more inclusive place for everyone. When we read in, in the scripture that God created man and woman, God created everyone else as well. Drew and his partner Hazel live in Southern California with their three kids. He was raised Lutheran in Minnesota and went to Catholic school, during which time he battled with gender dysphoria. I... Okay, we'll come back to the gender dysphoria and say a quick thing about that, but I'm more interested in the the theological take here about God made male and female and he made everyone else. So let's have a look at that. So here's Genesis 1 and this is where we get so much of what we believe about God and about ourselves and about the world. Um, and so to then say God made male and female and he made everyone else, that's imposing something on Genesis 1 that isn't in there. And once we start tweaking with it and saying we can change it or that bit's not relevant, that doesn't apply, then I think that leads us into all sorts of problems because this scripture is so foundational for us. So let's have a look and see some of the things that we draw from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Uh, we'll mostly look at chapter 1, but the things that we talk about go the whole way through the Bible. So first of all, you see that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This is all imagery of like chaos, disorder. And then God speaks and brings order and brings um, structure and life to the universe. And so from that, humans have derived that God made an ordered world. And that worldview, that philosophy led to the pursuit of science and technology and engineering and maths because we said, okay, God made an ordered world, so we should be able to observe that order and draw conclusions from it. So, like, huge, huge thing that was very different to other worldviews at the time. We take that from Genesis chapter 1. Another thing, let's have we look at chapter 1, verse 26. This is something that always that surprised me whenever I first learned it. I think we've become so familiar with this story that we don't really see this, but God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they, mankind, may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild, wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. Humans were made to rule the world. That is what God made us to do. And so that, like, we, we deviated from that plan and... Uh, we lost the ability to rule the world, but that's the, that's what God made humans for. And so that gives us so much value and worth and dignity. And then whenever we jump forward to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, you see Eden is restored and it says here at the end, they, like that's God's people, alongside God will reign forever and ever. So we were made to rule the world. We get that from Genesis chapter 1. Another thing that we get from Genesis chapter 1 is that we were to fill the earth with image bearers. That was like the, the job that God wanted us to do. Um, so that um, it said, God bless him and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We were supposed to fill the earth with people who 
reflected God's glory and who ruled on his behalf. And then from that, we draw conclusions about how we as Christians are to live, about God's kingdom, what the kingdom is, what it looks like. The kingdom is is nothing more than uh, a kind of building on what God's blueprint was from Genesis 1 and 2. We also see that, okay, they were to fill the earth with uh, image bearers. Said, let us make mankind in our image, they may do these things. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is absolutely huge whenever it comes to questions of like our worth and our identity and our purpose because quick like dunk against atheism. Atheism's whole founding mythology, their whole worldview is that the universe is a random accident, that uh, there's no purpose or plan behind it, there's no creator and so yeah you know we just happen to be here and once we die that's it. And so from that the conclusions you draw if that is how we're here and why we're here is that life's kind of meaningless, that it's survival of the fittest, that you just got to do what you want and maybe make whatever meaning you can. And if that means that you have to oppress other people and mistreat them so that you can get ahead, that's fine. Do you know, that's what atheism tells us. Christianity tells us that no, actually we're all made in the image of God. Every single person is equally valuable, worthy of infinite dignity and respect and honour because our value doesn't come from ourselves, the things that we do, the things that we can't do, the abilities and skills and talents we have or how we look. Our our value and worth and dignity comes from God. And because God doesn't change, that means our value doesn't change. So this was the basis for things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that said whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you are equal. And so that is the idea that we're made in the image of God is such a balm to any sort of feelings of worthlessness and self-doubt and insecurity because it's like, no, God made you in his image. Oh, by the way, if you're enjoying this video, one of the ways that you can help it spread to more people is by hitting it with a like. So if you do that, I would appreciate that. Thank you. And then whenever we read Psalm 8, this is, Psalm 8 has been called, oh, it's like the poet's reflection on the theology of Genesis 1 and 2. It's essentially, drawn out of Genesis 1 and 2 and saying um, when I consider your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you've set in place thinking of these big grand things and you know you see some photos of stars and galaxies and all this stuff and you're like wow that's sensational but then the psalmist says what is mankind that you're mindful of them human beings that you care for them you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour uh, you made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Again, this is drawn straight out of Genesis chapter one to say humans are astounding, incredible, valuable because this is what you made them to be. So this is where we get our value as humans from. Uh, it's also, the Genesis one is also where we get the trajectory of where God is bringing creation to. Whenever you read Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, all of this language is so soaked in like Eden language. Um, the idea of a holy city, the new Jerusalem, that itself draws from Eden stuff. Um, new heaven and a new earth, God space and human space overlap now. Um, the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Uh, and then in the chapter 22, this wee section is Eden restored. Angel, the angel showed me the river of the water of life flowing from God down the middle of the street of the city. Um, there were trees bearing crops for the healing of the nations. This is all Eden stuff. And so God's plan, and I could show you like a million, not a million, um, but there are like a million scriptures, so, so many, that say, that draw on Eden language, that draw on Eden imagery, and then build the theology of the Bible out of that. So then for Drew Stever to say that this bit is not relevant for now, that this wasn't written for 2024, is to go back to like our whole founding um, mythology is the, the phrase that's used not to say that it's not true, but to say that it's, it's the story that shapes how we view the world and life and our purpose. To say that that isn't relevant for 2024 just undoes the rest of the Bible. 
like I really don't think that's much of an exaggeration to say that if you pull out Genesis chapter one, you're like, nope, that's not relevant anymore. I think the whole thing comes crumbling down because everything flows out of Genesis one and two and three. It's as if Genesis chapter one, two and three, those are like the foundations of a building. And then as you go up the building, everything is based on the foundations. So you can't say, oh, I like the Gospels. The Gospels are the 40th, 41st, 42nd, 43rd books in the Protestant Bible. Um, you can't say, oh, I like the Gospels. We'll take the 40th floor and the 41st, 42nd, 43rd. Uh, we'll maybe take a little bit of this floor, but no, we're not going to. We don't need the foundations and we don't need Genesis, Leviticus. We don't need chapters. We don't need floor three because that's Leviticus and mm, it's a wee bit weird. It doesn't work. You need it all. It all builds off itself. And ironically, in the like longer video of what Drew Staver says here, um, he says that, oh, we just want to teach this, or his congregants say, oh, he's just teaching the stuff that Jesus said. Love your, love God, love your neighbor. But Jesus himself affirmed, like fully affirmed and reiterated this definition of male and female. It says, and some Pharisees, when some Pharisees came to test him, asked him, asked him about divorce, he said, have you not, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made the male and female? This is, we footnote here, that is Genesis 127, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. That is Genesis 2:24. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus, when presented with a question about the nature of marriage, reiterated Genesis 1's take on marriage and gender and said this is what it means to be made in the image of God. So to say that we'll take we'll take what Jesus teaches, you're not taking what Jesus teaches. And so if you're then going to say we'll take the bits that we like and we'll get rid of the bits that we don't like, then you're doing what Paul writes in Timothy when he's like they're the last days will come when people surround themselves with false teachers who tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. That's what's happening here. And note that, like, yeah, we only saw it. We only see a few clips in this video, but it doesn't look like it's a huge congregation. Um, there's a wee section at the end that we'll get back to this video here. There's a wee section at the end that I think is really interesting. Catholic school, during which time he battled with gender dysphoria. I grew up female and in the female context and I just never felt like that worked for me. There were definitely times where I, like, if I can't exist in one way, I don't want to exist at all. I would just be better off not alive. It wasn't until his school teacher introduced him to a different kind of Christianity, one that was accepting of everyone. And there was a moment where I woke up in the morning and the words that came to my mind was, you don't have to be angry anymore. It almost felt like God just took a snowball and just like threw it at my face. Drew's partner Hazel is also an ordained minister and supported Drew when he was getting a lot of hate online for being a transgender pastor. 68% of Protestants and 51% of Catholics believe that a person's gender is defined at birth, according to a study from Pew Research. Drew just pause it there we sec. Um, Obviously, this, this the source here is Pink News. They've compiled this little video. So what they define as hate online might just be what I'm aiming for, which is like, I don't hate this person. I'm trying to suppress any feelings of self-righteousness or feeling that I'm better than this person because that would be prideful and arrogant and sinful. Um, I don't I don't hate Drew Stever and I'm not like, oh, they're an awful person and you should yeah like dox them and vandalize the church and stuff so this isn't hate but whether this would be construed as hate i don't know but there are also going to be people who are like you're i don't know just send mean things to this person and like look this person's got a partner um they've got three kids yeah do you know if if people were being mean about your parents online you wouldn't really like that so let's just be nice but I'm sure you are nice. Okay, we'll continue. Drew has faced discrimination himself. Recently, he hung a pride flag outside of his church, and just days later, the flag was torn down and vandalized. He took to Facebook to address the incident, saying, this will never stop us from spreading the message of love, working for justice, and praying for the healing of all God's people. God's love is louder than hate. Drew continued. I think that's a little petty to see this church and to pull down a pride flag outside it. Not that like I'm, v I'm very much against pride flags hanging outside church, because... It's a whole ideology that is not based on the Bible and God's teaching. Um, at the same time, like the person who pulled that down, did they pray for Drew Stever? Did they pray for this church? Um, 
something I heard recently, which is really good and kind of keeps me in check on this sort of thing, is that it was pointing out the difference between um, like love for someone versus feeling self-righteous about them. And it said that self-righteousness is whenever you are moved by um, moved by comparison to judgment rather than moved by compassion to prayer. So I see this. I My natural human instinct is to think I'm better than these people. They suck at Christianity. I'm way better. But that is self-righteousness being manifest. Whereas I, my response should be, and the spirit like convicts me of this, my response shouldn't be, they suck. It should be, oh my goodness, these people don't actually know Jesus. They need to know his truth. They need to know his love because they're being lied to here. So moved by compassion to prayer rather than moved by comparison to judgment. Um, yeah, turn down pride flags, I said, church. I think it's a little patty. Like, what are you achieving? continues to spread love and positivity, opening his arms and his church to everyone. The pastor even uses his social media to spread queer positivity, showing the world that there isn't one way to be a Christian. He also showcases just how inclusive his church is. You are good. Nothing is wrong with you. You are so good. You don't need the church to tell you that. So that last wee section, I wanted to play through and show you um, in the longer video of this, the like longer interview, this is when he's saying like, you're good, you're so good. That's a response to... He said, like, oh, my message to people who have been mistreated by Christians and mistreated by the church, whether they are disabled people or racial minorities or whatever it is, um, that's what he said. At the same time, to say, like, you're good, you're so good, you don't need the church to tell you that. It's like we are, the church, are, like, we're the ones who have the scriptures and we're the ones who are supposed to teach people about Jesus because in Jesus is life. Like Jesus says in scripture, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the Father, as he's praying to the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. So we know him. Our job is to introduce people to him. So to say, we don't need the church to tell you that you're good. It's like, but without God, you've no, you have a much weaker basis for thinking that you have worth and value and dignity. But again, to go back to the image of God stuff, you do have worth and value and dignity. Um, the stuff about him, her, it's really, don't hit me over the pronouns, it's really hard. Um, the stuff about Stever uh, saying this stuff, I think it's worth replaying again. Catholic school, during which time he battled with gender dysphoria. I grew up female and in the female context and I just never felt like that worked for me. There were definitely times where I, like, if I can't exist in one way, I don't want to exist at all. I would just be better off not alive it wasn't i mean that's really sad that that is the experience of some people and there'll be maybe people you know who are trans or like you have some degree of separation from trans people who feel that way um the stats do show that for people who feel and experience gender dysphoria in their teenage years as rough as that might be i have no concept of how rough it might be but i've read that it is um around 80 percent of them will grow out of it if they're not kind of encouraged to any form of social or um, hormonal or surgical transition. And so it's not like so-called gender affirming care is the only answer to this. Yeah, I think there's another there's another alternative that isn't, oh, we go down this, this route of progressive theology because you lose too much. You lose what you're actually looking for. You're looking for meaning and purpose and validation and hope and comfort and Jesus and you lose them. So yeah, let me know your thoughts. I would love to hear from you and I'll see you in the next video. God bless.